Um, John 20, 19 through 23. Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Jews had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them and said, peace be to you. Then he showed them his hands and side. The disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were exuberant. <coughs> Jesus repeated his greeting, Peace to you, just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
I want to begin by, by <laughs> talking about a very important word in our dialect, and it is y'all. <laughs> you can say y'all, and it carries different meanings in the different ways that we express it. You're trying to get the attention of a group of people? Y'all. You got some news to share? Y'all. You got some gossip to share? Ooh, y'all. <laughs> and it goes on and on. I believe it is a better a plural pronoun than what I hear some people using that my mother and I agree kind of gets under our skin. Y'all like being referred to as guys? Guys? It won't affect your tip unless you do it too many times. <laughs> but I think we want to be included in a way that doesn't keep us so far away. Y'all come. You guys can stay over there. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, in, in this resurrection story, appears among his followers, and he says, Peace, y'all. Now, you may have heard it said, peace be unto you. <laughs> but what we do need to understand there is that the Greek word here is you plural. It's a word we don't have in our English language. And so for us folks here, I think it'd probably be a good idea to say, Jesus shows up and says, peace, y'all. He wants to make sure that everyone in the room receives that gift that he is there to share. And it is so nice, he says it twice. I'm giving you bumper sticker material today. As he shows up among them, peace, y'all. And then just before he shares the Holy Spirit with them, he says it again. Erene, amen. That's Greek for peace, y'all. Y'all, right? <laughs> and so, um, the, the important thing to remember about this idea of the peace that Jesus shares with us is that it is a community commodity, a good gift that Jesus gives to not only a plurality of people, but a great variety of people. And this gift of peace sets us free from fear. The story we have in the Gospel of John is that the disciples had locked themselves away in their clubhouse in Jerusalem. They were locked behind their doors for fear of what those accomplices with Rome had done to Jesus. What does it mean to hide away in fear? We can find ourselves hiding behind doors, putting up facades in front of ourselves for the sake of personal protection, compromising with things that we really don't believe in, and finding ourselves really not identifying with Jesus because we're worried about what might happen to us. So the disciples' situation can be very much our own situation, a situation of fear. Personally, I have a lot of fears. Uh, yes. 
I'm afraid of spiders. Amen. Especially the spider, especially the spider you see and then don't see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if you've talked with me about my fears at all, you know I am deathly afraid of velociraptors. <laughs> Thirty years ago, a great friend of mine, Jack Oliver, took me to the movies to see Jurassic Park. Thirty years ago. I'm also afraid of being old. <laughs> but Jack knew how to do the movies right. We went to the big theater, nigh unto IMAX, to watch Jurassic Park. And on the way in, he got a bag and said, we need candy. And we got a lot of candy. <laughs> so I watched Jurassic Park on this big, big screen in, a, in the daytime in a fairly empty movie theater. But it had a little effect on me. The next day I was playing golf and I was at a tee box where there was a hedgerow in front of me. And I just knew about right here, they were going to get me. They were just going to come right through those hedges. And I still watch out for them to this day. Now, John doesn't address the idea of our individual fears and phobias. But he does want to bring up this idea of a corporate fear. Because what John has pointed out in, in his gospel is that following Jesus really does come with a price. Dietrich Bonhoeffer would call it the cost of discipleship. And Jesus addressed it this way. If any of you would choose to follow me, take up your cross and come after me. And it's not so you can brag about being able to carry one but that you would be very well prepared to die on one. Following Jesus comes with a price. And I do believe that we often worry that we will be called on to pay it. So much for ensuring our peace. Huh? I've had a couple of great conversations over the last five years with David Anderson, and on two occasions in those good conversations we've had, he'll stop and ask me, what would you do if you weren't afraid that you would fail? What would you do if you weren't afraid that you would fail? And I would, and I hope we all would, Risk it all for peace. Jesus' version of peace. I think Martin Luther King Jr. embraced it very well when he says, Peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice. And what we learn from that and what we learn from following Jesus is that peace, there, there's more to it than just letting Jesus breathe it and say this is peace. Jesus breathes spirit, by the way. He greets us with peace. He greets us with shalom. He calls on us to share that peace with others. It is about the very presence of God and all of what's worth working for in this life. Because if we'd like to risk it all for peace, Jesus' version of peace, we do have to embrace the fact that peace is worth working for. And be ambitious in that work. Be ambitious in that work. Set some high goals. And invite others to go along with you to achieve them and I have to confess that I need to be forgiven for being vague about this. 
For quite often, my go-to is to pull Matthew 25 into this conversation <clears throat> and talk about feeding the hungry, giving something to drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, visiting the imprisoned and the sick. Those are good ideals, but they should be our starting point by which Jesus begins to ask us to take down the facades, to unlock the doors that we hide behind, and to really understand that he's standing in the middle of the room with us. We have real work to do, and within those categories, of giving food and water and clothes and our own presence. We have real work to do, specific ideas at hand to really work for peace. We work for Jesus's version of peace and he will not let us off the hook with a simple checklist of beggary. <coughs> We have to work to end the prejudice of sexism. And especially that which is aimed toward our sisters in Christ whom Jesus has called into ministry. <coughs> even that they in his name should be ordained as pastors. Something we need to know about this passage in John, it's not just 11 men locked in that room but other followers of Jesus were women. They were the ones showing up, telling them, telling those 11 that Jesus was alive. They are the first preachers of the good news. We have to work for racial reconciliation. We need to build more and more relationships with our neighbors, particularly our African-American neighbors, in order that in our own country, this problem of racism is a problem that we can move beyond together. And so I want to encourage you and <coughs> maybe even tell you can your pastor boss you around? Please, go to the Juneteenth celebration. Go with the mind that you are ready to meet folks, that you're ready to learn something, and that you're ready to be a part of helping our community move forward. Be curious, ask questions, and be there. As a part of that, we also need to work to renounce white Christian nationalism. It is not Christian. What we hear a lot of power brokers and politicians do is a lot of God talk for the sake of promoting their own agenda. And their own agenda is about gaining more power for themselves. Their own agenda is about economic and political gain. And in the name, they will invoke the name of the Lord to get what they want. Jesus concludes this passage here in John by talking about if you forgive sins, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And there are things in our world this day that the church is obliged to call sin and not compromise on it. And for the power brokers and the politicians, to basically baptize their sinfulness for their economic and political gain is something that should have our attention. It's something Jesus has already preached about very well. 
If you were to cause one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better that a millstone be hung around your neck and you be thrown into the sea. We need to speak up for what Jesus judges here as wrong. And here's how you know. If you hear the God talk from your power brokers and your politicians, if it doesn't measure up with the teachings of Jesus, if, it, if you can't find good reference points for it within the Sermon on the Mount, it is likely very wrong. Uh, that's that's soft peddling it. It's blasphemy. So keep reading the Gospels. Keep praying about your connection with Jesus. Let this mind be in you that was also in him. Let your discipleship be about service. It will inform how you send that email to your representative's office. It will inform the phone calls that you make. We need to work for the acceptance, inclusion, care, and health care, and the inalienable rights of LGBTQ plus children of God. My favorite y'all is that y'all means all. Jesus' peace is not a commodity we hide away and store only for the folks that we've been convinced are supposed to be locked in the room with us. But rather that this peace is <clears throat> the invitation for your brothers and sisters and your family of God to grow and we expand the gospel of Jesus just like Jesus would have. We need to work to end gun violence. Amen. This is our country's pandemic. And what we see year after year, and we are just let we're just a little over a year from the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. And there have been too many since then. But every time something like that happens, we see glaringly in front of us an idolatrous obsession with guns in our country. And the gun is sanctified and justified here with a tremendous lack of of compassion for children. It's bad enough for those who let, who would say something that causes our children to stumble. The sin is that there are folks who don't care if our children die. Now this seems like some lofty high ordeal uh, lofty high ideals for us to cover. And that's true. And how long should we work to see these things happen? How long should we work for this kind of peace? And how hard should we work for this kind of peace? Well, the prophet Amos has given us those words. We'll work for this kind of peace until justice rolls down like a river and righteousness like an ever-rolling stream. Can we really do that? Of course we can. Of course we can. But sometimes it seems like we're too locked away in our own fears to be able to do it. Sometimes these high ideals have to take a back seat to what we worry about regarding our own reputation. What would mama think about this? What would my coworkers think about this? What do my family and relatives and neighbors think about this? But I want us to work for these things. I want us to work for these high ideals and many more that will come our way 
And in doing that work, I really do hope folks find out you go to church here. Not because they heard something that your pastor said, but because of what we do together as a body of believers, embracing Jesus's version of peace. And we can come up with some beautiful ideas and plans, but nothing will derail an even ambitious plan for ministry quite like hearing someone say, well, we've never done it that way before. <laughs> I'd like to think that on that first Easter night in that upper room where all those followers of Jesus were gathered, that somebody actually dared to say it. We've never done anything like this before. Because I believe in that moment, in the presence of Jesus, it wasn't a word that defeated an ambitious plan, but a rallying cry. When we embrace the peace of Christ, yeah, you'll never have done it that way before. But it'll be right. We look at the work of justice and we start comparing it to the gospel stories and we come around to, an, to a conclusion that these were the bold, ambitious ideas that Jesus was crucified for. But let me counter that. Because a, a, that kind of talk might just lead us into more locked rooms where we hide away in fear. But these ambitious plans of justice, this ambitious work of justice is not what Jesus died for, but exactly what he was resurrected for. Jesus comes back from the dead. He appears to these fearful followers of his, locked away in their fear. He shows them his wounded hands and side. And it's not so that they can cheer and celebrate and buy lots of chocolate to, to honor that he's alive. But beyond the scope of their most crippling fears, they can fully expect that Jesus will show up and bring them back to life. And Jesus breathed, not on them, Peterson has a good translation there, into them, breathes into them the Holy Spirit. And that ought to have us remembering some Bible stories. In your second creation account in Genesis, God takes that mud and dust of the earth and begins to form a little doll out of it. And then God breathes life and spirit into that first human being. And when you were born, the first things we worried about was if you were ready to breathe. Some babies are born crying. Some of us need a little help. And there's a story in Ezekiel chapter 37 where God takes the prophet out to the valley of the dry bones. A place of utter defeat. A strong symbol that your country messed up and look what you got. And he asked the prophet, son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, Lord, only you know. And you know how this story goes. He said, God says, prophesy to those bones. And the bones rattle and click and they become knit back together and covered in muscle and skin. And then God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath. And the breath of God rushes through that place and brings these bodies back to life. 
The Holy Spirit comes through our homes, our worship services, maybe even in your car when you're listening to the right song on the radio. And the Spirit of God brings us back to life. And it's then those moments that we discover that we are created for a purpose. That our lives are being pulled back together for a purpose. And that purpose is that you and I become good vessels for God's Holy Spirit to fill us. A gift that's given to us so that you and I can live out what this good news of Jesus means. Yes, we do celebrate that Jesus is alive. That's how I got this jacket. Needed some Easter clothes. <laughs> and we also are called on to recognize that we are alive with Jesus. And with him, we have a lot of work to do. So there comes a moment when we do realize that we don't have to be afraid anymore. Instead, we receive the Holy Spirit, and from there, we're blessed to look at every challenge in front of us and declare very faithfully, well, we've never done it this way before. And when we do it that way, the operative word is never, y'all. It's always us. Amen. Even at this close of worship, if everyone will stand as we sing Holy Holy, the verses listed there in the <laughs> serve the Lord. May the grace of Christ our Savior, the love of God our Creator, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.